a moment of prayer. The title of my message, King Jesus, reigns in our world of turmoil. How we thank you that we have to turn to you now, Lord Jesus, our King, our conquering King, reigning over our world of turmoil and problems. But here we are in this place of worship to lift our hearts to you, dear Father, in obedience and in response to all that you have accomplished for us in this world and now in heaven, in your place of glory, in your place of authority. You are reigning over all. You are working through your church, even us today, dear Father. Your loved ones, we are here and we want to proclaim the glory and the majesty and the victory of you, Lord Jesus, in your place of authority now. So we want to bow before you, we want to submit to you and uh, to learn the ways of truth and to learn the ways of obedience and to learn to, way, to be effective in our witness in these days. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we turn to this dynamic psalm too. And if you have your Bibles, it, might be, it would be good to have them open because we'll work through in a little bit of detail. But today we do focus on this remarkable Psalm 2, this brief messianic psalm, so that's pretty significant, and so up to date and has a powerful message for us today in our modern world. Historically, it speaks of a coronation, this psalm, of a new king, uh, the uh, son of the father king, father handing the, or in, installing his son, uh, so it's a, it's a psalm of coronation. That's historically. But prophetically, it's the father now, or at a given time in history, anointing his son Jesus as our conquering king. And he is reigning now over all of the nations. So before we focus on the outworking of this um, amazing psalm, in the life and the ministry of Jesus and it goes, extends further out through um, the apostles and uh, right through to the end of the Bible into the book of Revelation through John the Apostle who's writing about some these same things. This psalm gets repeated quite often in the New Testament so it's fairly or very significant. So we'll just work through uh, verse 1, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? Straight away there's a massive world, we see a massive worldwide rebellion against God's authority. There's a fierce anger here against anything to do with God. Sounds a bit familiar. And, uh, and an overall mood of an anti-God culture. Sounds familiar too. So that's verse 1, verse 2. And the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's an in interesting word. It, uh, in uh, terminology of Old Testament, Hebrew, it, it refers to Messiah, the anointed one. So here we already have a reference to um, Messiah, the, our, the king. So we have a massive joint effort worldwide at all levels of society to denigrate anything to do with God and his anointed. That is a term that relates to the Messiah. Verse 3, let us break their chains and throw off the shackles. So a very determined effort to stamp out anything to do with Christian values or anything to do with God. Verse 4, the one enthroned in heaven. Hmm. There's a different dimension coming in here. The one enthroned in heaven laughs, says here. Uh, it, 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 wait on. This, what do we... Okay. Verse 4. Yeah, okay, verse 4, yeah. Here we go. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them with his wrath. Uh, ter terrifies them in his wrath, saying, "I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain." 
So, some may think that this fallen world of atheistic and agnostics, academics, are so smart that God can only laugh at their puny and futile ways of wisdom. So that's verse 4. Verse 5, verse five. let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. In reality, the ways of sinful depravity only leads to judgment. That's verse 5. He rebukes them. Here's the judgment. Verse 5. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion. In reality, then, all of these sinful ways, all of the depravity, all the division, really is being worked out in terms of judgment. And then a turning point here, a gracious turning point in this psalm, verses 6 and 7. I have installed my king on Zion, the holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, here we go, this is the anointing of a new king, the Messiah. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Again, historically has reference, application, but it also has a messianic reference and we'll come to that in a few moments. That's nine. Um, Ah, uh, yeah, verse eight, uh, yeah. Oh, we could go to verse 8. Yeah. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. Oh, this again is the fulfilment of the Messiah's messi messianic um, rule, authority. I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Ultimately, ultimately the Father's anointing of King Jesus will lead to possessing the nations worldwide as his inheritance. So an amazing authority has been given to Jesus in obedience to God's will. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. And that yeah, Immediately you go right over to the end of the Bible, to the Revelation, and that's just about what, that's a summary of what's going on in the book of Revelation. Judgment, uh, uh, opposition, uh, demonic activity, beastly activities, uh, opposition. So you break them with a rod of iron, you will dash them to pieces like pottery. So there's judgment there. Now, this, yeah, verse 9, ultimately our king is victorious in battle because he, is, he takes God's, God's judgment upon himself in obedience to the Father. So that's verse Verse 9, you will break them with a rod of iron, you will dash them like pieces of oil. He is victorious in the battle. Judgment will come in obedience, in, um, in, in, in our king's obedience to the Father. Verses 10, and, um, there, there, there's um, a warning here, therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Therefore, you kings and rulers of the earth, turn from your evil ways, repent, serve the Lord with fear, join in, cele join in celebrating his sovereign rule, sovereign plans in world history. So there's application here for worldwide uh, purposes of God working out in history. Kiss the son or he will be angry, verse 12. Or verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the son or submit to his son or he will be angry and your ways will lead to destruction, to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Submit to your newly appointed king. If not, your ways will lead to your destruction. Be warned. His wrath will flare up in a moment. Kiss the son. Kiss his son. Or he will be angry. And your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So there it is. It's a powerful... Uh, uh, Psalm uh, G and 
we want to see how this works out now in, in the New Testament. So let's briefly trace through the wonderful outworking of this prophetic psalm in the New Testament. That's why Ruby read to us those verses in Luke 24. You remember those two men on the, Emmaus, on the Emmaus Road were deeply moved as Jesus opened the prophetic word from the Old Testament. So we'll look, at a, a look again at that, um, at that reference. I want to show. See, um, it says here, uh, Luke 24, Uh, and this is what this is what the I impact that the uh, prophetic word had on these ones who were with Jesus. Those two, they asked each other, "Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened to us the scriptures?" So that's what I hope that can happen today. It's it's a burning thing within our hearts. We want to. Uh, respond to, the, to the, this word of authority. And so in verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So here we go. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures and he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and will rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. To all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So again, we're only in Psalm 2, but there's, there's a lot of prophetic detail about the, uh, the sufferings, the agony of Jesus. Very graphic descriptions in the Psalms of Christ going to the cross. But today we're looking more at the, the victory of Jesus in his reign in this Psalm 2. Psalm 110 is another one along similar uh, lines, but we, we'll, leave it at the, we'll leave it at Psalm 2 for today. So, now these final words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven deeply impacted his disciples to become passionate preachers of the word. And we've, we see that through the book of Acts. But um, before that, I want to apply, apply this uh, prophecy to Jesus. Um, yeah, it's in the context of the ascension, which uh, we, we, we had that reading together. But yeah, when he had led them out, this is in, in Luke 2, uh, 40, 24. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while, they, while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Were they sad? Were they disappointed? Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and stayed continually in the temple praising God. So there's an impact here of Jesus opening up the scriptures and uh, that in the, in the context of Psalm 2 with all of the hostility and all of the opposition and that's going to open up in the life and ministry of Jesus. He constantly faced uh, battles. It opens up in the book of Acts. There's strife and trouble. It opens up in the book of Revelation. So these are um, apostles uh, that have been given the responsibility to open up the meaning, the significance of this psalm. So today we focus on the ascended Christ, and it was a, it's 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 a, it's an expression of his victory um, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the words of Psalm two, therefore be be warned, you rulers. Of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss or submit to his father's son, or he will be angry and your way will lead to destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. That's what we're going to find. That's what we're going to trace through. 
Now let's briefly trace through some of these references which highlight his authority as our conquering king. Verse 7 is the turning point. I will proclaim, this is in Psalm 2, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. That is a familiar saying that um, is, is significant in the life of Jesus. So just briefly, uh, we could look uh, at, at Jesus' baptism particularly. Uh, I've got a reference here somewhere or a bookmark. Here we go. Mark, this is the beginning of Mark's Gospel. And this is, and John the Baptist is preparing the way. And so uh, we read in, uh, in, in relation to Jesus' baptism, Mark chapter 1, verse 9, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Listen to this. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. That's a drama in itself saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven. Here it is. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. There's the anointing of the Messiah, the father anointing his son with authority to rule over the nations of the world. And there is King Jesus, our conquering king. And what do we read the next, in the next line? At once the Spirit, uh, the Spirit sent him in, out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with wild animals and angels attended to him. Immediately after his uh, ascension, his anointing, Bang! Opposition. Forty days wrestling against temptation. In the world of turmoil, in the world of bitterness, in the world of, um, of, of opposition. But Jesus is reigning. Jesus is victorious. Jesus overcame the battle of... Um, uh, um, uh, well, he... Uh, he was, had his authority to battle against the powers of evil. The same thing happened in, at his transfiguration. Remember that he went up onto the Mount of Transfiguration. And there again, we can just re refer... Trans yeah, he went up into there. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from heaven. Again a voice. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And so there is a reminder again of King Jesus fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 2. And what happens after that? I believe this, this, this is a foretaste of the biggest battle of all that is to confront in a in a little while after that transfigured. But, but as they came down from the mountain, you remember, again they were confronted with a horrible uh, situation of uh, evil. The, the little boy, the, possessed by a spirit, threw him to the ground. The apostles or the disciples try, uh, prayed for his healing, but nothing happened. Jesus said, Oh, how long do I have to be with you in an unbelieving generation? Opposition, conflict, uh, it all came against him. And then ultimately, as he went through to the cross, he had to be reminded, or, or there was this reminder on the trans Mount of Transfiguration, the glory and the power and the authority of Jesus and, and, uh, and the in, the, in his, the appearance that he had on the mount, which was a foretaste of all that he had to go through, uh, through the cross. 
So here Jesus is uh, thrust into a horrible conflict against the satanic opposition. And so we can say, thank you, Lord Jesus, as our conquering king. And so, as I've just mentioned, the, another similar drama on the Mount of Transfiguration, which was a foretaste. The cloud came in all his majestic glory, and a voice came, this is my son. And then they descended and ran into opposition and conflict and darkness and demonic activity. And as I've said, this is a foretaste of the greatest battle of all. And then this ultimate victory by taking God's judgment on our sin on the cross. After that dreadful agony and his final cry from the cross, this great work of world redemption, his amazing triumphant victory over death, over the powers of darkness, over all that came against him, there was this wonderful message to declare which took place on the day of Pentecost an electrified gathering of people who were moved through the authority and the victory and the proclamation of the gospel. Now under the authority of our resurrected and ascended King Jesus, some powerful preaching through the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And on that day of Pentecost, as Peter proclaimed the word in the power of the Spirit, uh, again there's reference here. Uh, in his message, uh, at his Pentecostal message, Peter said again these words uh, that for David did not ascend to heaven. See, David, this is the uh, historical reference, did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, the Lord said to Messiah, Sit at my right hand. That is a place of authority until I make your enemies a footstool, for, a footstool for your feet. And that was the message. Therefore let all, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other, other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Submit to the Son, kiss the Son, repent. No, he didn't say that, but that's Psalm 2. Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to do battle against all the uh, opposition. And that's what happened. As we read on in Acts, remember Peter and John um, healed somebody, uh, crippled, and there was a great healing, there was a great commotion, there was great celebration. But, again opposition. The Sanhedrin, the authorities, the legalistics. What are you doing? How can you do this? And so they were thrown into jail. Oh, how are we going to stop them from preaching? Nobody could. And they said, look, if you stop preaching, we'll let you go. Yeah, they got out of prison. You know what happened? They report to a church prayer meeting. You know what happened at that prayer meeting? I should read it. Again, as a reference to this psalm. Um, uh, yeah, when these, the, the, the prayer people, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, and you spoke by, uh, by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the he nations rage? And the people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together and against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus. And so on. And we read a little bit further on. And after they prayed... The place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Victory in the name of Jesus, the King, 
reigning over all, even though hostility and opposition. What's different today? And then we can go on. About five years later, an absolutely astonishing breakthrough of a hardened enemy of the church dashed to the ground by our ascended conquering king. And I think we're all familiar with this. The Apostle Paul, we read. As he neared Damascus on his journey, they suddenly, uh, uh, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, So, so, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? He's supposed to be a theologian. And he's still asking who the Lord is. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And so a little later on, the Lord said to Ananias, Go to this man, my chosen. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And to just summarise all of that, you look at Paul's ministry. Uh, he, he, he preached with authority. There was great uh, response to the gospel. But look how much he had to suffer. The opposition, the Senate and all of the uh, conflict that he had to go through, the persecution, he was flogged, he was nearly, de de nearly killed at one stage, and so on and so on. He gave, goes into all this in 2 Corinthians, the struggles and the battles. But you know what? In the end, he ended up under the nose of emperor, uh, the Roman emperor uh, in Rome, and where he kept on preaching for two years he was under house arrest that's when he wrote some of his most dynamic letters King Jesus is reigning over all even the emperor of Rome why I mean why did he have to pick Paul but he did and what an instrument so there you go um yeah, and um, yeah. So uh, briefly, to, uh, that's yeah. I wanted to go to another reference here. Yeah, see, Paul spent uh, a whole chapter in First Corinthians chapter fifteen on the resurrection, and in the end, and that's speaking of the authority of the the reign of Jesus. He's conquered death. Therefore, my dear, this is how he concludes that chapter. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. That's just summing up, summing up the supremacy, the authority, the, uh, uh, the kingship of Jesus in, in defeating death. And so there's the victory. And that's the, that's the way that we are to minister. We therefore stand firm let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. And then, again, this is all briefly, a brief kind of overview, the writer to the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, a similar line. Listen to, listen to how he starts his letter. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets many, in many ways, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things through him, 
through whom he also made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had, made, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of, of the majesty in heaven. So he became much superior to the angels and so on. So there it is. After he had made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, a place of victory and authority and kingship. He is our conquering king. And finally, the Apostle John, who well and truly sums up the authority and the majesty, majesty of our conquering king, Jesus. Again, the whole of the book of the Revelation is in the context of painful persecution. A lot of it's kind of symbolic and all of that. But if you pick up just the gist of it all, there is opposition, there's the, the beast, the Satan, and, and so on and so on. It's a huge battle. But what a vision. What a vision of the crucified Christ. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise to him who sits on the throne and, uh, and, and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory forever and ever. So we've just been putting together or uh, the outworking of Psalm 2 and we've seen it to, in, to recap the, uh, um, through the different authors in the New Testament. And that's why Psalm 2 is so, is so important for us today. I think, uh, back. yeah, to briefly recap, this is powerfully um, fulfilled. This Psalm 2 is powerfully fulfilled fulfilled personally in the life and ministry of Jesus uh, through his baptism, his transfiguration, the cross and the resurrection and finally his ascension as king of kings. And then, the, then it goes through Jesus and his baptism and then it goes through Peter and his uh, apostolic uh, preaching then through uh, and through, uh, finally through uh, John. So there's a powerful overall me message through the book of Revelation, finally, to show the uh, supremacy of Psalm 2. And that's why Psalm 2 is so important for us today. What's prophesied in Psalm 2 is working out in our world today, according to John's prophecy in the book of Revelation. So in that, there's history, there's a historical purpose, purpose of God working through the whole of history from uh, Genesis to Revelation and uh, uh, in, in, as things are in our world today uh, that it's all coming to a climax when, and so we can, we can uh, find our security and our rest in our King uh, Jesus reigning over all. Okay, yeah. Okay. That's just a little bit of an overview of uh, the, the victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, dear Father, we are thankful that we have you to reign over all. We know we're up against all kinds of conflict and battles in our world today, but we are thankful for, for you, Lord Jesus, that you are on the throne, you are reigning over all, and that ultimately there will be the great victory in your return when you uh, have conquered all and the great, vic the great persecution that you went through, through the, in the book of Revelation and you conquered all of that through the authority of your word, the sword that came out of your mouth and so there was judgment in all of that and finally there is great victory when Satan is conquered and thrown um, into, the, uh, into the pit for eternity. So we thank you then for the great re rewards that we have through the wonderful works that you have done for us. So thank you dear Father, thank you for Jesus and thank you for the victory we have through him we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.